have everybody with us, and uh, for those of you joining us on Facebook, a very good morning to you as well. And for those of you who will be checking us out later on YouTube, we're glad that you've joined us as well. We've been traveling through the Gospel of John, and in a, a series titled Passionate Pursuit of Jesus. And we're in this lead up to Resurrection Sunday, we've been taking a look at some of the details in and around uh, the days right before Jesus' arrest false trial, crucifixion, and resurrection. Today, of course, is known as Palm Sunday. All right, so Palm Sunday, of course, centers around what we call the triumphal entry, which is the last time that Jesus enters Jerusalem before his crucifixion. Now, when I was growing up, okay, there's our title today, Behold Your King. Now, when I was growing up, the church that I attended in my early years often handed out palm leaves to the kids, always with the, the caveat to be careful of the edges because those things, I'll tell you, those things will give you a wicked paper cut, or I guess I should say a leaf cut, right? You know, and we usually just got the single leaf to wave around during the, the service, and of course we did, you know, all service long, much to the annoyance of our parents, right? You know, we all did that. And, uh, but once in a while, somebody would try to teach the kids to make those palm crosses, right? And they learned pretty quickly to have a big box of band-aids with them when they did that all right <laughs> but all four gospels you know cover this event in jesus earthly life and i don't know if you've noticed throughout our uh, journey through john but john was the i think the most succinct you know the 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 straightforward no frills style in his writing account right you know he, he's the most like just the facts ma'am kind of you know throughout his his uh, gospel and so let's take a look at that, all right, this, this, the triumphal entry of Jesus, beginning in John chapter 12, verses 12 through 19. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival, in other words, the Passover, they were there for the Passover, heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and, had, and that these things had been done to him. Now, the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. All right, so let's begin at the beginning, so to speak, and take a look again at verses 14 and 15, Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion, see your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Now, the first point about the triumphal entry is that it is a fulfillment of prophecy, all right? This is a callback to Zechariah 9.9, which says, rejoice greatly, daughter Zion, shout, daughter Jerusalem, see your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. All right, so one of the beautiful things about this event is that it reminds us that God's faithfulness to keep his word is intact, all right, and whatever he says he will do, he will do in the proper time. All right. He knows far more than we do when that proper time is, okay? And God fulfilling his word regardless of what we think or feel about it is something that we can count on and take confidence in. That Jesus takes the time to do this right down to the details, just shouts his position as Israel's Messiah and king, which brings us back to the palms. Okay, The crowds who came out to meet Jesus as he came riding into Jerusalem were waving palm branches. Okay, Cutting palm branches and waving them in greeting was often done to welcome kings and victorious commanders in battle. You know, they won the victory, they're coming into the city, people have the palms and they're waving the palms, right? And not only that, but as we see in Matthew and Mark, people were taking palms and spreading them out in the, in the road, okay, uh, as a signal that they were looking on their Messiah, 
all right? But they were expecting a military king to come kick Rome's butt. And as Jesus comes riding on the prophesied donkey, people start getting excited, right? They're like, maybe this is it, right? So they start laying out those palm branches. They start waving them because they're, you know, looking at their victorious king who's going to, you know, redeem them from Rome. And, uh, but this wouldn't have been those little single wimpy palm leaves we had as a kid, all right? It was more like something like that, you know, the full branch where they had the whole thing and they were waving that, kind of like a flag, right? You know, they were just waving those things and welcoming Jesus. And they start shouting, Hosanna, all right? So now we're going to take just a 2.5 second Hebrew and Greek lesson, okay? Hosanna is a Greek creation using Greek letters to fashion a pronunciation of the Hebrew phrase Hoshiana, meaning save please, or if some have translated save now, all right? So they're, they're calling out for the Lord to save them, right, from Rome. And there's only one other place in scripture where that phrase, where Hosanna is found, and that's in Psalm 118, verse 25, but we'll give it a little context. We'll back up to verse 22. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. There's the Hosanna. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. So originally, Hosanna was a cry for help, a plea for deliverance. But by the time of Jesus' day, it had kind of moved from a plea to salvation to an acknowledgement that salvation was coming. So right, so when they see Jesus and they, they're like, ooh, sal- God's salvation, but they're looking for salvation in the wrong place, all right? So back to the streets of Jerusalem. Jesus riding in on a donkey, fulfilling messianic prophecy. Can't read today. Messianic prophecy. The people all around, they're waving the the palm branches. They're putting them in the road. They're putting their cloaks in the road, okay, as described by Luke. That is an acknowledgement of kingship, right? So they're expecting the conquering Christ who would restore political power to the Jewish people, kicking Rome out of there and setting up his kingdom right then and there. That's what they're expecting. That's, that's what they're looking for. Quoting John MacArthur, they thought the kingdom was coming. He knew judgment was coming. They thought they would crown him. He knew they would kill him. All right, because for all their celebration, all their welcome, they were missing it. The Messiah had come as the suffering servant. He had come to save not from Rome, but from sin, all right. The only thing that they had right in that whole thing was, yeah, Yeshua had arrived as king, just not the king that they thought he was. All right. They were looking to be rescued from their circumstances, but they weren't looking to be changed in the process. All right. They were looking for freedom without accountability, deliverance without obedience. They wanted a political king, but not a sovereign savior. All right. Now, as Solomon put it, there is nothing new under the sun. You know, how often do we find ourselves, even as believers, in that same place? We want to be saved out of our circumstances. We want to be rescued from the consequences of our sins, but we don't necessarily want to change. That's repentance, by the way, that, that changing. We don't want to change our way of thinking and living, right? We, we, we end up in that spot kind of like, people in Jerusalem at that moment. Hosanna, here comes the king, save us out of this problem, but then I don't necessarily want to give up the problem, right? Because a week later, these same people who were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, were punching their fists in the air going, crucify him, crucify him, right? And the reason why is because they didn't get what they expected from Jesus, and so they turned against him. That happens a lot today, too. You know, a loved one passes away. You know, a baby is never conceived or is miscarried. An unexpected diagnosis is handed down. A divorce happens. A dream shatters. You know, the unthinkable becomes fresh reality. And in anger and pain and desperation, we shake our fist at God and we walk away from him. Right? Right? Some people come to the altar 
expecting that welcoming the king means welcoming in the American dream, right? Or welcoming in a life that is painless and trouble-free where we don't have to give up anything or sacrifice or any of that. And most people, especially in the Western church, have no idea what it is to welcome the king as more than just a get-out-of-hell-free card, but as sovereign Lord to follow all the days of our lives. And Jesus had something to say about that, all right? And let's look, look, we'll hop out of John for a second here and look at Matthew chapter 13, starting in verse 3. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell in rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. So see, the condition of our heart It's very important when we welcome the king, all right? Listen to what Jesus says about the seed that fell on the rocky places. Just a little further down, verse 20, when he's explaining things to his disciples. He said, the seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away, all right? Now, this also the words of Jesus hopping back into John. John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So we have to prepare our soil, right, our hearts, to receive the king and his word to us. We have to temper our bless you. (laughs) We have to temper our expectations with kingdom expectations. All right. We have to receive Jesus on his terms, not our own. Else we risk being scorched by the sun of difficulties and the persecution or reactions of others to our faith. All right. See, because it's in him that we put down those roots that we need to become fruitful, not, not fruity but fruitful for the kingdom, okay? And with the arrival of the king, Jesus immediately goes about kingdom business, all right? So let's check this out. Matthew, Mark, and Luke place Jesus' clearing of the temple after this triumphal procession into the city. So let's take a quick look at that in Matthew 21, starting in verse 12. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayers, but you, have, but you are making it a den of robbers. All right, so expectations here just got turned on their proverbial ear. Instead of declaring revolt against Rome, Jesus declared war on spiritual apostasy. All right, he goes after the priests and, 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 and the teachers of the law right here because the house of God had been turned into a place of buying and selling salvation, all right? Because in order to, to have the sacrifice, right, you had to have the right animal for the sacrifice without spot or blemish. That part was correct in the law, okay? And for those who were you know, poor enough or didn't have their own flocks, yes, they could, could get one there at the temple courts, Okay, that part was not necessarily wrong, but they could only do so if they had the correct temple coin, the correct temple money. And okay, if you didn't have that, you could exchange your coin for the coin of the realm, so to speak, all right, for that temple coin, only they did it at very high rates of interest. So the people who were poor, the worshiping poor who were coming in, were totally cheated and taken advantage of. Okay, the king came into his house and he started moving the furniture, literally. He was dumping over the tables of the money changers and, and all of that, right? He was, he was scattering the change, okay? When we receive the king and he comes in, guess what? 
he has full right to move the furniture. You know, if he dumps over a few tables in our hearts that contain things that take our attention away from him, he is he has full right to do that. All right? He rearranges our lives to make us more like him. Mm-hmm. He has the authority to do that. And as sovereign savior, you know, he's allowed. All right, so let's turn our attention to those old Pharisees, right? They pop up all the time, right? They're, I get this, okay? This blows my mind, all right? They are about to celebrate the Passover, and yet they're looking for a way to grab and kill Jesus, okay? Talk about a paradox or, or, or oxymoron or something, right? You know, it's like they're preparing for a celebration of God's deliverance of Egypt, which is also a prophetic picture of Messiah, by the way, you know, and they're planning murder. Wow. Talk about the outside and the inside realities, right? Okay. And so what happens? All right. A huge parade with Jesus at the head of it on this donkey, right? And the people are giving him a royal welcome. They're shouting out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that's not exactly an opportune time to uh, snatch the upstart rabbi, is it? Right? You know, and not only that, but they are absolutely jealous of the following that Jesus has accumulated among the people, regardless of the reasons the people had in coming. Okay, yeah, they were looking for, you know, physical deliverance from Rome, but I mean, the, the, the priests and the Pharisees, they were completely jealous of this adulation that was being given to Jesus, okay? And this is not the first place in John's gospel where we hear them with this complaint, this is getting us nowhere. You know, there are several times throughout John where he notes them saying this, you know, this isn't getting us anywhere. You know, look at how the whole world has gone after him. Let me guarantee you one thing. When the king moves in, when we get serious about welcoming the king and doing things on his terms and going about doing our lives his way, not everybody's going to be jumping for joy when that happens. You're going to find that old acquaintances, old habits, old hangouts do not hold the same attraction as they once did. All right? You're going to bump into resistance from old friends maybe even from family members who don't want to share you with Jesus. You know, they want to keep you where you were. When King Jesus begins moving the furniture around, there's going to be some chatter from the peanut gallery. You can count on it. This is the essence of spiritual warfare. Ephesians 6.12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You know, the enemy does not like it when the king of kings takes up residence and starts redecorating. All right? And oftentimes Satan will use people, even those who are closest to us, to try to interrupt the process. Now, in Matthew's account, the Pharisees' jealousy extended even to the little ones who praised Jesus' name. Picking up in verse 14, the blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them, you know, Jesus. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. All right? They got their stuffy on, right? Look down the nose at you, right? Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise? And some translations call forth perfect praise. You know? I tell you what, I hope we never get offended here at the voices of littles raised in praise. You know, there is nothing more precious or more beautiful than a heartfelt Jesus loves me from a five-year-old. All right. And the hallelujah chorus and all of its orchestral and choral majesty cannot compare with the simple love of a little girl, little boy, singing Jesus loves me from the heart. You know? And I'll tell you what, Jesus feels the same way. 
Nothing wrong with Hallelujah hallelujah chorus all right nothing wrong with the grand and the majestic and the wonderful because it is beautiful and you know it is offered as praise and and there's nothing wrong with that but it cannot compete with that little little girl little boy singing jesus loves me this i know for the bible tells me so now in luke's account it was Jesus' disciples that were getting a little rowdy with their worship and praise. And, and the Pharisees tells Jesus to rebuke them. And I love Jesus' reply here too. You know, it says, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. I love it. Jesus accepted that worship and praise. Carnal religion will always seek to douse true worship and praise. The moment that Jesus takes up his rightful place in our lives, first place, and starts to move things around and dust other stuff off, carnal and worldly-minded religion will seek to drown us out. That's not how we do things here. Those kids are a distraction. You should have them back in the back. No. Because the spiritual power dynamic begins to seismically shift during praise and worship when we are offering up honest, true praise and worship to the King of Kings because it's about him and it's not about us, right? Just like the disciples in the streets and the children in the temple, we can't be silenced, right? We cannot be intimidated. I don't know about you, but I don't want any any dusty, dirty stone taking my job, you know? So what can we take with us on this Palm Sunday as familiar to us as it is, you know, every year? We, we look at that, we ruminate on it. Well, there's a few reminders. Number one, it's not about our expectations. It's about Jesus' kingdom agenda. You know, sometimes Jesus gives us some of our expectations and wants, you know. I mean, when it lines up with his will, you know, and he's a good God. And he knows, Harry said this all the time, I love this, he's a good God and he knows how to, you know, do good things for his kids. You know, it's like he takes care of his kids. But when what we want goes against what Jesus wants, guess who has to back down? Not Jesus. Okay? When that happens, we have to obey him. We have to submit to him. And honestly, it's so much better in the long run when we do. And when we don't, we find ourselves five miles out in left field and realize we've got to come back, right, you know, and ends up wasting a lot of time and effort, right, to realize, oh, yeah, I guess I should have listened. But when we, we, when we submit those desires to him, maybe it's just a not yet even, you know. Sometimes we just have to realize we need to put everything in Jesus' hands and go his way, and then when his time's right, and we go, oh, that's why you made me wait, right? You know, sometimes that happens, but it's so much better in the long run when we submit to him. Number two, Jesus is not just the victorious king, he's also the sovereign savior. When we receive Jesus on his terms rather than ours, he's going to start moving that furniture around and fixing up the place. And we do best when we cooperate with him and sink our roots deep down into him for faith and sustenance so that we begin to grow in him. And we begin bearing fruit for the kingdom. Number three, when the king takes up residence, there will be opposition to his rule. You know, whether it comes in the form of old friends, temptations to old sinful habits, or carnal religion, we can't be taken off our guard, but we've got to keep our eyes on Jesus, who's what? The author and the perfecter of our faith. And then number four, praise and worship will change the spiritual dynamic around us, all right? When we find ourselves dealing with spiritual warfare, praise and worship along with the word of God, those two should be our weapons of choice. All right? There is power in worship. So let's not let any old dusty rocks take our job, take our place, right? Which what? Brings us right back to the palm branches. Behold your king. Hosanna, right? Say it with me. Hosanna. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let's pray. 
Lord Jesus, 